All right, let's try to wrap up our Lewis structure review here. Uh, we had just finished part two talking about sulfur trioxide and its Lewis structure, sort of an unusual thing because we had what appeared to be one double and two single bonds. In reality, that second bond here is shared in all three positions, so it turns out to be um, each sulfur to oxygen is one bond plus a third of another bond. So that bond's a little bit longer than a double bond and a little bit shorter than a single bond. It's three bond and a thirds. And to illustrate that, we draw what's called resonance structures, showing the bond in all three positions. Now, when we build the Lewis, when we build the molecular model, it's oftentimes easy just to pick one of the three to build the model. So I just pick this one here, and you can see I have a double bond here, even though, of course, we know that's really not a double, it's a bond and a third, but for the sake of building this model, it's easier to show a double bond and two singles. And you can see that these atoms are all on the same plane here when they're bonded. So the shape of the molecule is trigonal planar. Now the electronic geometry is interesting. We have, let me use this model to show that, if you had three what we call sp2 hybrids stuck to the sulfur atom, they'd be as far away from each other as possible. And they are actually on one plane. You'll notice they're not, you know, forming a pyramid shape because they're too close to each other when we do that. So they form this planar arrangement. So the electronic geometry in SO3 is trigonal planar also. Bond angle? Well, let's take a look. If we put our three oxygens on here to my central atom, which we're calling sulfur, yeah, that's like a circle cut into thirds and that would give me an angle of 120 degrees exactly. There's no non-bonding up here like we had a few minutes ago to push these closer together, so this is a perfect 120 degrees. Use your spaceship analogy, is that thing going to move? Nope. So that's nonpolar. So that's SO3. Let's do NO next, and that is an interesting Lewis structure, because we're going to end up with an odd number of electrons. See, nitrogen has five valence, oxygen has six. So that's a total of 11 valence. So obviously somebody is not going to have a full octet. Now we're going to belabor this just for a minute. We'll give a single bond between nitrogen and oxygen just to illustrate that you can't have a full octet here. Um, we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. We're only allowed 11. So we'll try a double bond between nitrogen and oxygen. And once again, we'll try to give each atom a full octet. So we've used 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Well, we are allowed 11. We're almost there. So one of these two atoms has to be shorted an electron. Don't you think the most electronegative of the two atoms would get its full complement of 8? So do I. So let's give the full octet to the oxygen and nitrogen will have an odd electron. So there's your Lewis structure for NO. Now there's only two atoms, so of course that shape has to be linear. They are different atoms, so the dipoles do not completely cancel each other out. So this molecule is polar. Now, take a few minutes of your own time, look up the word dimer, D-I-M-E-R, and see if it applies to this molecule, NO. Okay, moving along, we're finally going to get to expanded octets here with PCL5. Now, PCL5 is interesting. Phosphorus, let's take a look at where it is on the periodic table. It's in the same family as nitrogen, so it has five valence electrons. Each chlorine has seven valence electrons, so I have 40 valence to worry about here. Let's try to draw its Lewis structure. Of course, we'll start by putting four chlorines around it. And I'm going to start using lines for non-bonding electrons. It's just going to be a bit easier now. And we end up giving each chlorine a full octet, but that only uses up 32 of my 40. So the extra pair goes on the phosphorus, the center atom. And then we'll give that chlorine a full octet. 
and we end up using 40 valence. Believe it or not, that's the correct Lewis structure. Phosphorus can have what's called an expanded octet. Atoms with three or more energy levels can have expanded octets. See, phosphorus ends with 3s2, 3p3. Three energy levels, 3s2, 3p3. It has a d sub level it can expand into. It's not being used at all, but uh, actually, in this case, it is being used. Um, normally, it's not being used, but in this case, it can expand into that D sub level and have what's called an expanded octet. When we get to hybridization, you'll see the hybridization for this turns out to be SP3D. So we have the S orbital being used, the P sub level, and all of its orbitals being used, and a D orbital to give me five pairs around that phosphorus. Now something like nitrogen cannot have an expanded octet because it has two energy levels, 2s2, 2p3. It does not have a, th uh, a third energy level which has of course a d sub level for it to expand into. Now let's do the electronic geometry. If, if we have five pairs around the central atom, how far are those five pairs going to be? Well, if we imagine each of those pair being a balloon or one of these little purple plastic figures here, you can see that they would take on this arrangement. They can't fit on one plane. We can't put five pair on one plane in sort of a pentag uh, pentagon type of shape. Those five pairs are going to repel each other to be as far away from each other as possible. And so they take on this arrangement. We call this arrangement a trigonal pyramid. Sorry, a trigonal by. My pen's not working, actually. My fingers aren't here. Let's try that again. By pyramid. A trigonal by pyramid. Now, all five pair are bonding. So we'll go above, below, and then we'll put three right on the plane here. And so we end up with a shape, since all five pair are bonding, of a trigonal by pyramid. Now, there are two bond angles here. Do you see a 90 degree angle right here? That's 90. And then do you also see 120 here on the plane? So there's actually a 90 degree and a 120 degree bond angle when we have this trigonal bipyramidal structure. Polarity, use your spaceship analogy. We have a spaceship pulling this way and this way, and then three pulling on the plane. It's not going to go anywhere. So this is nonpolar. Let's do another one, SF6. The sulfur has six valence. Each fluorine has seven valence. Let's see, that's 42 plus six. I believe that's 48 valence altogether. Let's see if sulfur can have an expanded octet. That's right next door to phosphorus. It has three energy levels. It has an S, a P, and a D sublevel that's available to expand into. So let's see. We will put the four fluorines in their normal positions, right on the four sides of the sulfur give them full octets. So I've used 32 of my 48. And I'll put a fluorine here and a fluorine up here. And so now we have six fluorines each with uh, eight valence. That's 48 and I've reached my max. So we have six around the center atom. Six pairs will take on this shape so that they're as far away from each other as possible. And we call that an octahedral shape. So we don't have all six on the same plane, obviously. There's just too much energy required to keep them on the same plane. So they spread out and they form what's called an octahedral structure. Now all six are bonding. So we'll put those six bonding pairs on there. Let's see if two were bonding, they'd look like that. And a third and a fourth. And the fifth, we'll put that up on top. And my sixth down, oops. And my sixth, I'll go down below right here. And so, of course, the shape of the molecule, since all six pair are bonding, is also octahedral. Now, the bond angle here, we see 90 here. We see 90 on the plane, so we see 90 degrees. Some of you might argue and say the bond angle here is 180 from end to end, but we usually just go with the 90 degrees. And the polarity, using your spaceship analogy, would be nonpolar. 
Okay, XEF4. Now this is interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, we have a noble gas forming a bond. You wouldn't expect that. But at very high temperatures and bonding with a very electronegative element, you can get noble gases to react. And this is an example of that. Xenon has eight valence. Each, oh, I did that backwards. Each fluorine has seven valence. So we have 28 plus eight. Hopefully I'm doing my math right. We have 36 valence electrons here. Put xenon in the middle, and we'll put our four fluorines on there, giving each a full octet, and of course that gives me 32 valence, but I'm allowed 36, so I have two more pairs to add. We'll put those on the central atom xenon. Can xenon have an expanded octet? Does it have at least three energy levels? It has six energy levels, so it definitely has a D sublevel to expand into. Alrighty, now the electronic geometry, since there are six pairs, is octahedral. Right? We have six pairs, but this time not all six are bonding. Only four of them are bonding this time. So we have to find a nice low energy situation for four of them to bond. So we have six pairs all together. I'm going to put my first two pair above and below. I'm not going to go on, uh, above and, and right on the plane because that's pretty close to each other. They're going to want to repel each other. So the lowest energy would be to begin with when we have two bonding would be right across from each other. Then of course the third one has to go on the plane and if we stop there we'd have what's called a T-shape. But we're not. We have a fourth bonding and we're going to go opposite with that. And so we have this neat little structure called a square planar arrangement. Okay, so the shape of this molecule is square planar. All right, bond angle. You guessed it. We're going to go with 90 degrees. And it is nonpolar, as you can use your spaceship analogy and determine that. Okay. CLF3, chlorine has 7, each fluorine has 7, so we have 21 plus 7, I believe that's 28 valence. So we'll put our chlorine in the center, we'll put a fluorine on each side, we'll put one down below, give each fluorine a full octet. That's uh, 24, 26, and 28. So chlorine has an expanded octet, it looks like, in this arrangement. Does chlorine have at least three energy levels? One, two, oh, it does. So it does have a third, uh, a D sub level to expand into. So here we have five pair around the central atom. Remember, five pair, that's my trigonal by pyramid. Now that's the arrangement of the electrons, but not the molecular shape. So we're going to start with five pair, and they're as far away from each other as possible, but only three are bonding. So we end up with sort of an interesting call here. We're going to put one on top, and where's the next one going to go if it's bonding? Is it going to go on the plane? Mm, they're sort of close to each other, there's 90 degrees. Let's put it opposite. Wouldn't that be more stable? So that's where the first two atoms are going to go. Where's the third going to go? Well, the third has to go somewhere on the plane. So we end up putting it right there. Now this shape we call a T-shape. You all see that? We call that a T-shape. Looks just like a T, doesn't it? So we have a T-shape. Now the bond angle, ugh. you know what? Let's go with 90. But if you were to suggest that these two non-bondings might squish these a little bit closer to each other and say a little bit less than 90, I could not argue with you. But for simplicity's sake at this point, let's just go with 90 degrees for the bond angle. Now this would be polar. We'd have two spaceships pulling here, which would cancel each other out, but this guy would be pulling it this way. So this guy would be a polar molecule. Now I want to do one more for fun. This is one of my favorite shapes. What if we had um, a trigonal bipyramid electronic geometry? We call this sp3d hybridization, and we had four bonding atoms, four of them. So, you know, we go one up top and one below, right? They're as far away from each other as possible. There's two of the four, and that would be linear so far.
put one on the plane and that's my T shape that we just saw just a few moments ago. Now the next bond would go here or here. It really doesn't make a difference. We're going to add it here. So we end up with this shape at this point. And the, it's called an irregular tetrahedron, but nobody ever calls it an irregular tetrahedron. They call it a seesaw shape. So if you ever see five electron pairs and four are bonding, we end up with this cute little seesaw shape. Let's go ahead and do that same thing with an octahedral electronic geometry. If you had um, a total of six pairs and two were bonding, you know that shape would be linear. If a third were bonding, that would be a T-shape. If a fourth were bonding, we saw that a few minutes ago, that was square planar. If a fifth were bonding, it could go up on top or down below. We'll put it down below and flip it around for you. We call that a square pyramid. A square pyramid. And then, of course, if the sixth were bonding, we'd end up with our octahedral shape. Alrighty. Well, I hope you enjoyed your discussion on Lewis structures, predicting shape, bond angle, and polarity. Sorry we didn't do too much as far as hybridization is concerned, but we'll have to pick that up in class on a future video. So thanks for your time. Bye-bye.